It's certainly starting to look more like the U.S. is on the verge of entering into a recession. And people are suffering, showing a lot of angst, a lot of concern. And during the last video we produced, we got a lot of comments about stocks that already looked cheap, but had even fallen some more because stock prices have been falling precipitously this week. And the market's been weak now for some time. And again, there's the threat of the recession. But I'm going to talk about recessions more in this video but I brought up Oracle here just to make a point. The recession of 2000, 2001 lasted about eight months. That's this little green shaded area here. I use this example because they have a May fiscal year and I'm still showing the recession of 2001. And then you can see we had six years of a bull market until we hit the Great Recession, I call it of 2008 to 2009 that lasted one year and six months. But then we've had this long run bull market until we hit the COVID crash. Now we call this a recession. It was the shortest one on record if you actually want to consider a recession. But now here we are getting ready to go into recession. We've got, you know, obviously threat of, of war, you know, of going into even a, a world war. That's obviously on the minds of everybody. You've got runaway inflation. You've got the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. You've got unprecedentedly high stock market. Market. You've got pending food shortages, possibly. You've got supply chain disruptions. There's a lot of negative starting to come out. And when a market is as highly valued as it's been recently, then that kind of angst comes out. It can really create some real issues. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. And the title of this particular video is going to be that recessions bring opportunity, not risk. Risk is how you react to the recession. But the recession of itself usually brings opportunity. And, you know, as a value investor, recessions turn out to be the best markets for value investors because these are the markets where value investors can find the bargains. You know, Warren Buffett always often, or said once, you know, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. That simply speaks to the point I'm making here. When stocks are cheap and inexpensive is the time that you want to buy them. That usually comes with some bad news. But bad news tends to be short-lived and good news in the economic terms tends to be longer lived, as I shown you with the first chart I brought up here. So we're going to talk more about recessions here in a moment. But I really want to make a point that, you know, as a value manager and value investor, I always often find myself at odds with my clients and investors. I begin to get excited in markets like this because I see opportunity knocking. I see prices becoming, you know, realistic and prudent again. I, and, and I see having the opportunity to invest in really great businesses and then participate in their long term. And I emphasize long term future growth. EDMP is an acronym I use often for earnings determined market price. Now you can talk about earnings or cash flows or sales, all lots of other metrics, but I'm going to keep it earnings here. Earnings drive market price. And that's what I'm showing on this graph. Or you can see in the long run, the earnings, the orange line on this graph is what drove the stock price of Oracle. And when it got disconnected, it corrected back to the orange line. When it got undervalued, it corrected back to the orange line. And you see that on virtually every fast graph you'll ever look at. Now, there's an evil twin sister to that. Emotions determine market price in the short run. And people tend to get caught up in the short run but true investing, to me, is all about taking advantage of the long-run opportunities that the short-run imbalances give you. And that's really what the key theme of this particular video is going to be. So I've put together a real short portfolio here. I call it Opportunity. I'm going to be looking at Cisco, Oracle, Parker, Hannafin, Pentair, and Target. Okay, these are companies I've even covered in recent videos. I just want you to see what's being going on here. Now, I had a comment when I covered Pentair in my last video. I showed that the stock had been greatly overvalued last year, and it's now coming into fair value territory, and it's overshot fair value territory, and it's beginning to develop a margin of safety. May not quite be there yet, by the way. I'm not suggesting that it is. The stock could have further to drop. But the point is, it is now in attractive territory. You could buy this stock today, in my opinion, and hold it for the long run and be okay. Your only risk would be whether it fell another 5 or 10% or more in the short run. But if it did, the prudent investor would buy more because they're going to focus more on the value of the business. That's what value investing is all about, rather than the short-term emotional you know, valuation that the market may be putting on it, whether it's being optimistic or pessimistic at any moment in time. 
Now, I had a comment on the last video where I featured Pantera, and it was an interesting comment because they talked about back in 2004 and five, Pantera looked really overvalued, but it really wasn't because its earnings were doing great. And that's true. Earnings growth in 04 was 36%. Earnings growth in 05 was 42%. So those were two really good years. And the PEs never got much over 28 to 30, 31 times earnings. So you could argue that even though it looked overvalued, it wasn't. But I want to make a point. It's not the short-term numbers that really matter the most when you're a value investor. It's the long-term numbers. So if we look back on here, you know, Pentair from, you know, 2001 to 2006 grew at about 15.39% a year, okay? But if I take this further up here, we see these big numbers that we talked about showing up here. And, you know, the stock really looked like it was overvalued, but it really wasn't overvalued because you had the 36% growth and the 42% growth. So really, the stock wasn't necessarily overvalued here because it was the earnings were doing well. But if you look at just this long-term cycle here, this five-year period that I'm showcasing here on the graph, earnings were only a 10% grower. That warranted a 15 PE. So my argument is you want to be thinking long-term, not short-term. Short-term issues, in this case, they're short-term upside issues, can be really devastating in the short run, but yet attractive in the long run. Now, moving on to Parker Hannafin, to put that into perspective, you know, during the Great Recession 2008 and 2009, their earnings fell 44% from $5.61 to $3.13. The stock price followed suit, and yes, it overreacted. But this created a tremendous buying opportunity, as you can see by looking at it back in 2020 hindsight, to get into a really good company that had really good growth ahead of it. Although, you know, spotty, there are going to be some good years and there's going to be some bad years. We need to be realistic. But the company stayed in business. The recession lasted a year and six months. The recovery lasted, you know, more than a decade. And we're coming into a point now where the stock is now falling into reasonable valuation again. So, you know, you always have opportunities to buy really great stocks during recessions. And when you get into these, you know, really crazy periods where the stock prices are just way overextended, that's when you have to worry. That's when the risk really exists. So, you know, I showed you Oracle already. Let's go into Cisco, then finally into Target and try to keep this video short. Okay, Cisco has come out and, you know, it had gotten overvalued. You can see how devastating valuation was. This is the market value line, the blue line on the graph, showing what average market values were over various time frames. Note that that line changes quite a bit. You know, Cisco actually got inexpensive. The market was putting low valuations on it during this period of time, you know, averaging about 13 times earnings. And then, you know, in the long run, in the long run, it's been about a 15 times earnings company. But in the short run here, you know, there were some periods where the PEs got up into the 40s and 50s. You have to recognize those as anomalous times. But every time the stock got cheap, those turned out to be the best times to buy the stock. And that's the point that I want to emphasize here. It's so important. Now, let's look at forecasting for a moment. And I want to bring up a update on Cisco that doesn't, isn't quite coming through the fast graphs yet, but will be. This is the earnings guidance. You know, the earnings, previous earnings were a lot higher than they are now. Guidance has come in and said earnings are going to be 329 to 337. Now, let me contrast that for you. That's in contrast to 344. This has a July fiscal year which the market was predicting. So 344 is what the market was predicting. Now the market's predicting 335, and then 380, 379, and 419. Now, I want to go to the forecasting calculators here for Cisco, and I want to show you something you can do here. Now, this will update itself probably in the next day or so. But for now, let me help you do it. I'm going to go to the custom calculator. I want to walk you through this slowly as subscribers. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to include the, the near term. This is the trend line estimate that it defaults to. I'm going to click this button and put the near term estimates in there. So we've got the $3.44 that I talked about before. I'm just going to click in this box and I'm going to type in 3.35. 
which is the new estimate, and then I'm going to hit enter, and I want you to watch what happens to the orange line in the earnings. I'm going to hit enter, and you see that little dip there. Now I'm going to go to 2023. The forecast now is 360 from the 370, so I'm going to go ahead and click in this again. I'm going to type in 3.6. Got it in there. Then I'm going to go into July of 2024 and go from 389 to 379. So I'm going to type in 3.79, and then I'm going to hit Enter. And you watch the line just, you know, ever so slightly drop. Then I'm going to go into 2025 and type in 419. And this has 402 because that was trend line. It's actually a higher number than what was in here by the time I get out there. So I'm going to type in 4.9 and hit enter. And you can see the changes were so subtle. Now, if I look at, at Cisco today, you know, using the current market price as I'm presenting this video, I just go into the Seeking Alpha site here. It's down 14% to 41.62. All right, we'll call that $41 a share and be pessimistic. This is 48. I'm going to type 41 in the last column here. Again, hit enter, and this drops it down, and it shows you where we are. Now, this is the adjusted guidance that the company has. I don't consider Cisco going out of business. In fact, I'm going to show you something here real quickly. The company and management talked about it in their earnings release. So I'm going to go into the Seeking Alpha website again. I'm going to go into the earnings section and go into transcripts. I'm going to look at the earnings call transcript. All right. And I want you to see what the guidance that the company, I'm going to search for guidance. Okay. And this is what the company is saying on guidance. You know, with respect to guidance, please see the slides and press lead that accompany this call for further details. Cisco will not comment on its final guidance, but they do talk about the fact that they have great faith in the long-term viability and growth potential of the company. Okay. And so they say the fundamental drivers across our business are strong. We are facing some short-term challenges. It does not change our long-term outlook or alignment to our customers' most critical challenges. And, you know, the point is that they see this as a short-term issue. They've got, you know, all the things I talked about in the introduction. But the real value, if you're focused on the orange line, which is the value of this business, this is beginning to be an opportunity now. And this is what, you know, the adjustment with today's pricing currently going on. The stock, nothing has really changed dramatically that should alter your view of this company, in my opinion. This line has just slightly slipped. Now, the big one, the one that's really on the minds of everybody is Target. Okay, Target is the one that really got everybody's attention when they announced it. So I'm going to now bring up the new guidance of Target, if you will, for you. And you can see that the guidance went. Now, before I do that, let's go back to the website here. The estimates prior were showing $14.60 for 2023, $15.90 and $17.85. This updated guidance is now down to $10.70, $13.58. And so I'm going to go back into the chart here like I did before. I'm going to go into the forecasting calculator. I'm going to go to the custom calculator I'm going to go ahead and bring in the estimates tab so that I've got the near-term estimate showing. Then they just let the trend line numbers go. I'm going to take the 1460 that was currently being you know, forecast prior to this, and I'm going to put in the 1070. I want you to see this. I'm going to hit Enter, and the line you can see dramatically went down. Okay, that's obviously we're facing a bad year. It might be too early to get into Target at this point, but I would again argue if you got into Target today, you'd be probably do great in the long run. So now I'm going to go to 2024 and change that to 1358 from 1560. I'm just going to click in the box, type in 1358, which is the new guidance range, you know, is what you know what the new estimates are, and hit enter. And I've got the 1358 in there, and that's a big upswing. You know, that's a 48% upswing from what they expect this year. And then I'm going to go to January of 25, and it's 1563 from 1765. So I'm going to put my 1563, hit enter, 
And you can see that, that it changed, but it didn't change barely. Now, now, let me do one more thing for you. The current price of Target, which is, you know, the carnage is clearly not over, is down another 5%. We'll call it 153 round numbers. And again, be conservative. So if I go into this box here and type in the 153, okay, and then hit enter, now I've got an updated fast graph. And if I point to the year end, that would still give me at a 15 multiple or 16 multiple, which I believe is fully attainable for this company, would be a, almost a 20% rate of return from here out to the end of the year. Now, the stock could drop significantly further, 10, 20% further, in my opinion. But historically, if I look at the low PEs, it was 1280. Even in the depths of recession, it was 1046. The PE is you know 11.66 as of yesterday and slightly blooded. That's about as low as Target's PE has ever been. So if we're looking at the forecasting graph and you know going to this custom calculator, and I should have saved all this data, you know, the point is that this stock now is created a great opportunity to be a long-term investor in Target. You have to still navigate the short term. I'm not you know arguing that, but you have to figure that Target will still be in business five years from now. Historically, it's gone through down years before more than once. You know, that's quite, remember, this is a very powerful company. It's an A-rated company. Debt is manageable at 54.7% to capital. You know, they got, you know, roughly half and half, if you want to look at it that way. The company does still have long-term growth potential, though I do expect now a down year for Target for this calendar year. They're fighting the headwinds of inflation. They're fighting the headwinds of supply chain interruption, shortages. You know, those things are affecting a lot of retailers, not just Target. But I do believe in the long-term viability of this country. So I'd like to go now and kind of end this video by taking a look at, you know, historical recessions courtesy of Wikipedia. It's a list of recession in the United States. Now, early recessions, you know, back to 1700s, you know, were, were really something. You know, they were four years long, six years long, and so on. Then we had the free banking era, which led to the Great Depression, the really big one, and of course, you know, 29 to 33 there area. And here we had, you know, recessions that lasted, you know, four years, one year, six months, two years, five months. Then from the Great Depression onward, you know, we'll call this the modern era from 19, you know, 1929 to 33 was the Great Recession. It lasted three years and seven months. But then notice that all the subsequent recessions for that have been about a year, year and a half long. The Great Recession, which was the worst since the Great Depression, was only one year, six months. Now, this, this chart's only updated through October of 09. You know, I'll get into showing you that here in a moment. But the point is, you know, if I look at all these recessions, they're very, very short-lived. If I look at, you know, companies like using, Ar you know, Oracle as an example, just our last recessions, even this Great Recession, we end up with this long-running bull market. Recessions create opportunities, okay? They don't create risk if you focus on the right thing. You know, the price line is always going to be dangerous. The orange line is always going to be much more reliable. And like I said in my last video, the dividend line even greater. Because if you look at, you know, some, you know, high quality companies like, say, Johnson & Johnson, you know, one of the few AAA rated. And look, they went through the recession. Their earnings did not miss a beat. Their dividend did not miss a beat. They did get hurt in COVID, but then recovered strongly. But when I put weekly closing stock prices on the graph, you see that the price dropped during the recession, but the earnings kept going and the stock price recovered. And then they went into this period of being overpriced. And so the market was putting high valuations on the stock as it is now, in my opinion. And, you know, thanks to the pending recession, we're starting to see some weakness in the stock, which might bring Johnson & Johnson back into the buy range. It has to fall into about the 150 area from the 175 area before I'm interested in buying it again. It happens to be one of my biggest positions, by the way, but I wouldn't be buying it for new clients today. So recessions tend to be short-lived. Bull markets tend to be long-lived. And you got to remember that every recession and every bear market ends with a bull market. And bull markets tend to be a lot stronger and longer than bear markets. Just trying to bring some common sense and perspective to you. You know, we are going to face some tumultuous times here. And again, it's how you react to that. 
The worst thing I think you can do is sell at the bottom of the market. The first rule of investing is buy low and sell high. It doesn't work when you buy high and sell low. But just because the stock price falls does not mean you're wrong. Peter Lynch said this. And just because the stock price goes up doesn't mean you were right. And I've shown you examples of that. You know, I had one comment on Fortune Brands. I see Fortune Brands as a tremendous opportunity here. And the drop in valuation is simply causing it to become even more and more attractive. I think that's the key. Now, if I'm looking at the short-term results, this stock was actually overpriced. This long-term chart, when you had 20-some percent growth, makes it look like it's been inexpensive all these years. Remember to use the tool and shorten the time frame. It was actually pretty pricey the last two or three years. It has now finally come into value range. And, you know, as the earnings continue to grow, I believe you've got an opportunity here to really buy the stock cheap. Now, you have to constantly monitor this because things can change as they are right now and change rapidly. But the bottom line is, I tried to make that point clear with all these companies. None of them, in my opinion, are going out of business. None of them are, you know, dropping, you know, going to zero, which is what I think people fear. This is just a time, if you think of recessions as times of opportunity, I believe you'll be a more successful long-term investor. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival saying thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this update on the recessions coming. Keep in mind, I'm not suggesting it's over. I think we're probably far from it. I think we're just entering it. What I want you to start looking at is the opportunity it's bringing rather than seeing the risk that you believe it's bringing. If you already own stocks and they've dropped, I believe your best choice, if they're good companies and the earnings are higher, then the price right now on the orange line, if you're a FastGraph subscriber, stay the course, buy more, you know, but, you know, be patient, let the market bring you the opportunity. Don't chase it, let it bring it to you. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, ring the bell, give me a like, subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you haven't already done it, subscribe to FastGraphs. There's no time that FastGraphs is more valuable than during recessionary times because it helps you keep your head. You can look at the value of your stocks based on the, the intrinsic value of the business, compare it to the stock price, and see, recognize that, hey, my stock is now undervalued. It is now a bargain. It is not a high-risk situation. It's high risk when the prices are excessively overvalued. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it gives you a little better perspective on what's going on. Thanks for watching.